Last week we started this series uh, called The Other Side, Side, A Study of Heaven and Hell and the End of the World. Let me just clarify, um, if we don't see the end of the world, the end of the world is coming for us at some point. That was kind of a brief encapsulation of last week as we looked at the cheery subject of death. Um, That was wonderfully encouraging last week. I went home and cried a little bit and uh, prayed for the rapture to happen sooner rather than later. But um, tonight, um, we're going to be digging in a little bit more to look at uh, an important and important topic. Uh, We as believers believe that there is life on the other side of death. And death is an entry point for us. Um, The hundreds of funerals that I've done, the hundreds of funerals that pastor has done, um, we know for the believer that death is a step into the rea- their actual reality. This has never been meant to be our home. Our home is supposed to be in the presence of God. And so death is just kind of that doorway to our eternal home. And so um, we're not alone in that because anthropologists, the, the people who study human nature and humanity, would would reveal scientifically that almost every single culture since the beginning of time have believed that there is life beyond. There's something innate in man that tells us that there is something beyond that other side that makes us curious, that makes us interested, that makes us at times fearful. But they would study and say every single culture has always believed in an eternity beyond. It it looks a little bit different for every culture. Uh, For instance, the Egyptians, they would leave maps in their pyramids. So when their pharaohs woke up on the other side, they would have a, a guide for their journey. The Australian Aborigines believed that life Uh, beyond this life was an island on the distant horizon in the West. Every culture has always believed in eternity after this earth. It's only been about 200 to 300 years where uh, atheists came along and said, there is nothing beyond. Now listen, I can't think of a more depressing state to live than to think that this 75 or 85 or 95 years that I'm given on this earth is it. That's woefully depressing. But somewhere along the age of enlightenment and in the 1800s and scientific discovery, man decided, you know what, we can set aside eternity because that really doesn't matter. What matters is here and now. And while the here and now is important because we have children and we have wives and we have churches and we have the gospel to spread, the here and now is not what we live for. We live for eternity. But oftentimes Christians um, don't really contemplate eternal things well, right? None of us really want to ponder our own death. I mean, how many in this room as you woke up this morning thought, you know what? Today may be the day I die. How many did, no? I mean, maybe I did because I'm a bit of a hypochondriac and I had a little bit of an ache in my arm and maybe Pastor Mark did. I mean, uh, but most of us don't contemplate eternity. And when we do, we contemplate it a little bit wrong. Most of our concepts of heaven and hell and eternity are shaped and formed by the culture around us. Let me just show you this image. It's going to be on my screen, Eric. It's going to be on the TV up here. But this is what we think of when we think of eternity. It's on the the sides over here. You've got God or Peter with wings. You've got Homer Simpson. We're floating along in the clouds. How many, when you ever see anything represented in popular culture in heaven, always kind of have a resemblance to these images? Like to me, heaven feels really smoky, right? Because cl- like, I, I don't do well with clouds and smoke and stuff like that, but, but that's the representation of eternity. And we always, when we think of eternity, we think of some sort of unusual bliss in the clouds and we may have wings, we might get a harp and, and that's it. But listen, this is not what eternity really is. Barna's research says this, I I quoted him last week. He tells us that Americans 
overwhelmingly believe that there is life after death, heaven and hell, but they find that they are often cutting and pasting the religious views from television, movies, and conversations with friends. And for most Americans, the concept of heaven and hell is a subjective idea. In other words, we decide what eternity looks like for us, but the Bible is specific and clear about eternity. Two-thirds of Americans, two-thirds of Americans don't believe in the resurrection of the physical body. And so that tells us that many people don't have a true concept of what our ultimate goal is for the Christian. So tonight we're going to talk about two things, primarily. Number one, it's not in your notes, it's what happens when we die. And number two, what is our ultimate promise? But before we get there, I want to briefly touch on something I touched on last week. Uh, I I say this a lot in Bible study classes. I say this a lot here. Uh, We need to understand the difference between primary issues and secondary issues. I talked about this a little bit, but it's on my board so you can see it. Primary issues are issues that deal with our salvation. Let me get an actual pen that writes. Here we go. Issues that deal with our salvation. My third grade penmanship there. You got like that? Issues that deal with our salvation. So they're things like God created. That is an issue that deals with our, crea- with our salvation because if God didn't create, if he's not the author and finisher of life, then something greater than him exists right? Another one is that Jesus came and died, lived a life, a sinless life, and died for our sins, an issue of salvation. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a metaphor. He was a physical being walking on this earth and died for our sins. Secondly, or thirdly in this primary issue is that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't I, don't, I can't tell you how many Christians I talk to that, that don't actually believe in a physical resurrection. They believe that Jesus rose from the dead and he walked around as a ghost for some number of days. But Jesus physically rose from the dead. And I'll show you why that's important tonight. Because it has to do with our own resurrection. Issues of salvation. And, and another issue of salvation is this, that we are all eternal and we will either be rewarded or we will be judged. That is an issue of salvation because what are we saved from? Judgment. And then there are secondary issues. Now, there's a host of secondary issues that theologians get in the room and debate and nerd out over and, and can argue over, over and over and over again. These have no real lasting effect upon our salvation. So these are issues um, that, that, that are interesting, that are debatable, that are interpreted, but they don't have a lasting impact on our salvation. Now, I'm going to make pastor cringe for a second because as I go through a couple of these, I'm not even going to look at them, okay? All right? Listen, the age of the earth does not have impact on our salvation. What has impact on our salvation? That God is a creator. If he wanted to create it in one day, a thousand days, 10,000 days, so be it. The issue is that he's a creator. Now we can debate about it. I have a certain set of beliefs. I'm, I'm kind of that young earth-ish guy. I believe that, that there's some, there's some uh, indications there. Jesus seemed to point to it, but it's not an issue of our salvation. So it sits in the, prime, in the secondary category. Does that make sense? It doesn't, it doesn't matter with your salvation. It's just something we like to argue about. Water baptism, I, I did this a little bit last week. There are people who dunk, there are people who sprinkle. There, you know, that's not an issue of our salvation. The number of spiritual gifts, although Paul writes list in the Bible, it, uh, you know, we can argue which number is right. And then listen, specific issues regarding end times events are secondary issues, right? 
And we'll dive into some of these a little bit, lean into some of these in February as I kind of walk you through that because there are some different views. And I think it's important that you understand that there are different views out there. And I'll clearly state, here's what I believe. Here's what I see. Here's what we believe as a church. But it's important for you to understand that sometimes there are secondary issues. Now, why does this matter in, in what we're talking about? Well, because oftentimes we get into conversations about end times things and, and you're like, wait a second, pastor. You're talking to him, not me. Wait a second. I don't necessarily see it that way. And that's okay. You can still worship under the roof here. You can still take communion here. You can still love Jesus and see things a little bit different. So as we wade into some of these issues, we're going to wade kind of with humility and go, mm, this is, this is kind of tricky. This is kind of a sticking point. But there are some very core issues that we have to understand as believers when it comes to the end of the world. And we're going to deal with one tonight. So let's dive in and look at it for the Christian I'm about to rock your world. For the Christian, the goal is not heaven. The goal is resurrection of the body. Like I said, two-thirds of believers that, uh, believers that believe in the resurrection do not believe that we will be resurrected in a physical body, yet pri a primary belief or a creed of the early church states that I believe in the resurrection of the body. R.A. Torrey would state that we will not be disembodied spirits in the world to come, but redeemed spirits in a redeemed body living in a redeemed universe. Randy Alcorn states in his terrific book on heaven, he tells us that we don't, if we don't get it right on the resurrection of the body, we get nothing else right. So let me show you this here. Look at Genesis 2, 7. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning and work our way through every single book of the Bible tonight. No, I'm kidding. Um, we're, I just want to show you the beginning. I just want to show you the beginning. This is the, the moment that God creates man in the Bible. Now, now look at the text specifically. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then look at this the man became a living creature. So watch this. One plus one equals that. Man is not disembodied from his body. He is both physical body and he's both spirit and that comprises his self. Does that make sense? So oftentimes when we think of heaven, we think of us just kind of being spirits floating around in the air, playing a harp or lute or whatever it's, it, you see the pictures of. And that's our eternal state. And that's not our eternal state. Our eternal state, again, is resurrection. The importance of the resurrection of body connecting with our spirit is the ultimate goal for the Christian. And this is what we see right at the beginning. Most Christians have adopted an idea that our souls are more like a hermit crab. You know what a hermit crab is? I don't know, do y'all have hermit crabs here? In the South, we have hermit crabs and hermit crabs are crabs that are, I guess, hermits. I don't, I, I'm not sure. I, I think the reason they get, I think the reason that they get the name hermit crab, I'm not a scientist, but I think the reason is, is because they actually don't have a home, but they migrate homes because they take on shells as they're covering, and then they drop that shell and get another shell. And most Christians look at our eternal state kind of like a hermit crab, that we can easily be disengaged as a spirit from our body, and that's going to be our eternal home. And that's not the case. It is the resurrection of the body that the Bible teaches over and over again. The idea of this separation between spirit and body and spirit going up into heaven and dwelling with the gods actually comes from Greek philosophy. It comes from Plato, which saw that there was a dual nature of man and that the physical body was evil, but yet the spiritual body was important and the pinnacle. This is why when you read 1 Corinthians, 
that Paul writes a lengthy detail of our physical resurrection to a Greek church in Corinth because there was this idea coming into the church that said our flesh does not matter. The body, the home of our spirit does not matter. All that matters is our spirit. So when Paul opens up, uh, when he starts writing his letter in 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, let me put it on your screen here. Yeah, that'd be easier, wouldn't it? Now, if Christ has, is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, meaning they're gone. They're not coming back. Verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, meaning Adam, by a man also comes the resurrection of death. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. So Paul is saying that Jesus rose from the dead physically to conquer death. And then one day when he returns, he will resurrect the dead. So Christ one day will physically return. And when he does, he raises up with him all those who are asleep. And this is a hope that comes, that goes throughout all of scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. Job says this, for I know that my redeemer lives and at last he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. Isaiah writes this, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy for your dew is a dew of light and the earth will give birth to the dead. Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Amen. And he follows up with a question to his disciples that I would put, pose to you. Do you believe this? This is what our hope is. Paul says this in Romans. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. It is a physical resurrection. It is skin and bones being restored. Old Testament writers, though they saw in part hoped for a physical resurrection and New Testament writers believed in the same. Scholar, author, pastor John Piper says this, Christianity is not a platonic, meaning Plato, religion that regards material things as mere shadows of reality, reality which will be sloughed off as soon as possible. Not the mere immortality of the soul, but rather the resurrection of the body and the renewal of all creation is the hope of the Christian faith. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher in the 1800s, said it this way, the resurrection of the body is the Christian's brightest hope. Many believers make the mistake that when they long to die and long for heaven, those things may be desirable, but they are not the ultimate for the saints. The saints in heaven are perfectly free from sin and so far as they are capable of it are perfectly happy, but a disembodied spirit never can be perfect until it's reunited to its body. God made man not pure spirit, but body and spirit, and the spirit alone will never be content until it sees its physical frame raised to its own condition of 
holiness and glory. Think not of our longings here below are not shared in by the saints in heaven. They do not groan so far as they have any pain, but they long with greater intensity than you and I for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. People have said that there's no faith in heaven and no hope. They know not what they say in heaven. Faith and hope have their fullest swing and their brightest fear for glorified saints believe in the promise and hope for the resurrection of the body. So when you bury your beloved friend or family member and they're a believer, the hope is they will physically be resurrected. That is our ultimate hope. Resurrection is truly the final stop on the other side. And listen to me, all believers will be resurrected. Really, all humanity will be resurrected. All believers will be resurrected, but all of humanity. Here's what I mean. Some are resurrected for eternal uh, creation. And again, some are resurrected for judgment. Most believers will die. But all believers, regardless whether or not they are dead or alive, on that day will be resurrected with Christ. All believers will receive a resurrected body. Now, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. The joy that that should bring a believer, it should be overwhelming. It's why we as believers don't fear death. We we don't run toward, towards it. We don't revel in it, but we don't fear it because we know that nothing can destroy us because he will resurrect us one day. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 14. I want to show you this. These are just some truths or ponderings or thoughts about resurrection that I'll give you the rest of the way, but in your resurrection, you're going to have a familial closeness with God that you have never experienced before in your life. Look, look at this passage in John chapter 14, and when you get the context of this, this will make so much sense. Here's what it says. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you will also be. Now, that's a powerful passage in and of itself, but contextually, it becomes even greater. What Jesus is promising is the promise of a groom to a bride. See, when we think many rooms, we think mansions. That's what I was always taught. One day I will have a mansion in heaven. How many were taught that? And, and I, I even designed mine a couple of times as a kid. It's going like, to have like speedboats and um, a roller coaster inside. I mean, that's, that's where our mind goes. We're going to have mansions because that, sometimes that passage is translated that way. Well, Jesus is using marital language here, a groom to a bride. What do I mean? Well, historically, in the Jewish custom, the, the male, the man, would get engaged to his wife, and then he would go back home, and he would begin to add a room or a couple of rooms onto his father's house because they lived in this familial-type commune. There's some displays of this in Israel, and if we, when we go in next year, you'll get a chance to see that. But what the, what the groom would do is he would go and he would build a house onto his father's house. And they would, when it was done, he would go back and he would take his bride, bring him back to the family home, and then they would all live together. So what Jesus is saying is not just, hey, I'm going to go prepare you a place. What he's saying is, you are a part of me. And you are going to be a part of my family. You are going to be with God. There is going to be a closeness here like none other. Amen. It's a powerful verse when you see the context of it because Jesus isn't just making a promise of his return, although he is saying, I will return. He's making a promise of a relationship here. 
in the resurrection, there's a closeness with God like never before. It's why the book of Revelation tells us in Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Now think about that for a moment. What would our lives be like if God physically entered into the room and just hung out with us. The reason that might not give you goosebumps is I think you might have a small picture of God. God is author and creator of every single thing we see. He knows from beginning to end and he has no time to himself. And he wants to make his dwelling place with you. Thank you for that one amen. (laughs) I'm not worthy of that. You're not worthy of that. I'm a flawed piece of creation. But God chooses to dwell with us in resurrection. He dwells with us. He walks with us. He talks with us. But not only that, our resurrection bodies will be like his. They will be Christ-like. Philippians tells us that our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await, uh, await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. John writes that we shall be like him. So our resurrected bodies will be like Christ and they will be physical and you can touch them and you can touch him. And he demonstrates this in, in the gospels when he appears to the disciples and he says, look at my hands and feet. It's myself, touch me and, and see for the spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Right. And then Thomas, doubting Thomas comes in the room and he sits there and goes, that's Jesus. I must be hallucinating. That's a ghost. That's a spirit. And Jesus says, no, Thomas, let me take your hand and put it in the scar. It is a physical body. It is a physical resurrection. The Bible views the physical body apart from sin as holy, good, and valuable. It's not a bad thing. It was always designed, created to be good and perfect. It is sin that has ripped it asunder. It is sin that has ripped spirit from body. It is sin that brings death. And in the end, in the end, we will be resurrected and completely stored. There will be no marring of creation any longer when the resurrection of the dead happen. It will be perfect. So I know what the question is. Well, pastor, what will that look like? How will that function? Well, let me just give you some biblical evidence, and I need to go fast through this, so I'm just going to give you some references here. You can look them up later. Number one, our resurrected bodies will be eternal. Most Christians understand that, that we have an eternal state. That means it goes on forever and ever 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 and ever. If you ever are on a long drive and you're worried about falling asleep, start contemplating what forever and ever and ever and ever and ever is, and it will mess you up and you will stay awake. Some of you, I just ruined your sleep tonight. You'll be like, forever and ever and ever? How's that work? There's no stop clock on this thing? Nope, it's forever. Our resurrected bodies will be eternal. I I, got to read this quote because I just, I love this quote from Joni Erickson Tata, who herself is a quadriplegic. She said, I, uh, she talks about the hope of a glorified resurrected body this way. She says, I hope in some way that I can take my wheelchair to heaven with my new glorified body. I will stand up on the resurrected legs and I'll be next to the Lord Jesus. And I will feel those nail prints uh, in his hands. And I'll say, thank you, Jesus. He will know, uh, he will know I mean it because he will recognize me from the inner sanctum of sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings. He will see that I was one who identified 
satisfied with him in sharing of his suffering so my gratitude will not be hollow. And then I will say, Lord Jesus, you see that wheelchair over there? Well, you were right when you put me in it. It was a lot, lot of trouble. But the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you, the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. I do not think I would ever know the glory of your grace were it not for the weakness of that wheelchair. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. Now, if you like, you can send that thing off into hell. So our resurrection body will be eternal. The pains that you have, the aches that you have, do not go on forever. For the believer, there is hope in eternity. Our resurrected bodies will be beautiful. Now, they will be eternal and they'll be beautiful. 1 Corinthians 15, which is an important passage, and you can read that tonight at a later time, says it will be raised in glory. Imagine the sinless beauty of the inner person overflowing into the perfect beauty of the outer person. Now, I'm not talking about vain beauty here, but I'm talking about pure beauty. The closest thing we might get on this earth is a baby holding a baby with a fresh diaper. That's the closest thing we get, right? They're almost radiating love and joy and peace and hope. It's usually us stupid parents who wreck them, but in their infant state, they are almost perfect until they learn that very first word, which usually is no which is a sign of the curse of sin. <laughs> That's the closest we get. Now, the Old Testament will say, well, kind of gives an indication of what this beauty is when it comes to Exodus chapter 34. It gives this description of Moses. And it says that whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses was shining. It was radiating this pure beauty. Daniel tells us that wise... The wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And Jesus himself says, the righteous will shine like the sun. It is, this is this way of saying that in our resurrected state, it will be perfectly beautiful. But not only that, our resurrected bodies will be powerful. Will be powerful. I'm 47 years old. I am, thank you, praise the Lord. Somebody's a believer in here. I'm 47 years old. And somewhere along 40, 41, 42, I experienced something new in life. And that was waking up stiff and sore. Right? Some of you aren't in your 40s yet, it's coming. Death is coming for you, it's coming. (laughs) We ache, we creak. Some of you pop. I hear you on Sunday mornings as worship. That's not the drums, that's your joints popping. Right? There's there's this decay that's happening before our eyes. Right? It's sad, it's terrible. But our resurrected state won't be like that. If there's sleep in eternity, and I'm not sure there is, but let's say there is sleep, I don't think you wake up and your your right knee pops and your nose whistles and all (laughs) kinds of stuff. I don't think that happens because our body will be perfectly restored, perfectly. The scars from the surgeries that you had, the, the pain, Everything will be gone. Our bodies will be perfectly powerful. Charles Spurgeon described this conversation with the body as it aged, and he 
said of this poor, poor body, he said, you have not yet been newly created. The venom of the old serpent still taints you, but you shall yet be delivered. You shall rise again if you die and are buried. You shall be changed if the Lord should come suddenly. Your poor body, which drags me down into the dust and pain and sorrow, even you shall rise and be remade in the redemption of the body for the new creation has begun in me with God's down payment of his spirit. We will be powerful. I don't know what we'll look like. I hope I get a couple of inches on my height and I hope I trim up a little bit, right? I hope that happens. Otherwise, I hope there are no mirrors in heaven. But God will recognize and resurrect us into this powerful state. I'll be able to be able to beat everybody in golf, I think. Looking at you, Paul Detheridge. I think. But not only that, our resurrected bodies will be recognizable. Our resurrected bodies will be resurrected, will be recognizable. Uh, most people ask. What will heaven be like? Will I recognize my loved ones? What, what, what will be going on here? Well, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, it talks about a table where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are recognizable. It says, I, I tell you, many will come from the east and re west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Moses and Elijah are clearly recognizable by Peter in Luke chapter 9. So our resurrected bodies, you will be able to recognize the people in this room. And based on all we know of Scripture, our resurrected bodies will reflect our uniqueness. Based on what we see in Scripture. Look at Revelation chapter 7. It says this, After this I looked. And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out loud in the voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So notice what John is seeing. He's seeing distinctions within heaven. There will be uniqueness in heaven. There will be uh, cultures in heaven. There will be nations in heaven, tribes and nation. We will have this uniqueness. The return of Christ and the resurrection of Christians will usher in the restoration of creation. Paul talks about this in Romans 8. And he says, for all creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, meaning during the fall, not willingly, but because of him who sub just subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There is a sense in which creation is waiting upon the return of the Lord as well. Martin Luther would say it this way. Our Lord has written the promise of resurrection not in books alone, but in every leaf in springtime. In a couple of months, blooms start to pop again. I have an apple tree in my front yard. I think it's dead. I think it's dead. Like Ellie, this past summer, picked all the apples off and baked a pie, which was good, but crunchy. But I, I, I think it's dead. Like part of it's, you know, all, the bark's falling off and part of it over here is leaning a little bit. It, it doesn't look good. My hope is that gets resurrected this spring. My hope is that there will be a bloom that pops that kind of mimics, though it was dead, behold, it is alive. Amen. That's what Martin Luther is saying when it comes to resurrection. Creation will be physically restored in honor and beauty forever. I don't think it's a mistake that we see at the tree of life in the Garden of Eden is also referenced in Revelation. So it tells us that this new creation will be the perfect state of what creation was once before. 
everything restored, including God walking amongst us. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Randy Alcorn says this, do you ever sense creation's restlessness? Do you hear groaning in the cold wind? Do you feel the forest loneliness, the ocean's agitation? Do you hear the longing and the cries of the wells? Do you see the blood and pain in the eyes of the wild animals or the mixture of pleasure and pain in the eyes of your pets? Despite vestiges of beauty and joy, something on this earth is terribly wrong. The creation hopes for even anticipates resurrection. So last week we talked about death. This week we talked about resurrection. Next week we're going to talk about that in-between period. What is that about? What happens when we die and we wait for resurrection? We're going to talk about that next week, but I want to read you one more passage as we close. It's my favorite passage when it comes to end-time things. It's from Peter. You may have heard me quote this before. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So all the hope of resurrection is being watched over by our creator, eagerly awaiting the day when he can bring restoration to all things once again. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the hope that we have. I hope I have done justice to your word tonight. And I hope I have cleared up some misconceptions for the believers in this house. One day, everything will be restored. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to fret about that. As we age, we don't have to fear death, but we can have hope that if you raise yourself from the dead, you will surely raise us physically to be with you. May we be reminded of that constantly, consistently, day by day, and may it bring us to worship in your mighty name. Amen.